brilliant to see so many people here um, today uh, to hear um, John uh, Toomey and Sheila O'Donnell speak. Um, welcome to the uh, Liverpool School of Architecture end of year um, showcase for 2021. Um, this is um, one of um, several events that we've had this week. We're at the sort of midpoint of the week, so um, we're very excited um, to welcome O'Donnell and Toomey um, to speak to us. Um, we've had um, a large um, number of events going on, um, showcasing the work of the school, um, and we're going to um, conclude that um, tomorrow with the um, M Arch 5 um, showcase, which is happening at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, and then Showman is going to um, speak to us um, and deliver a lecture about his work um, with Archiam in Oman um, tomorrow at six o'clock. So um, really do invite you to come to both of those events. And then our our conclusion of the week is our annual prize giving um, that's happening at two o'clock on Friday. You can find links to all of those um, things and the events that we've had um, on our website, Virtual LSA. Also, um, the recordings for this um, talk and all the other talks and events that we've had um, will be available on the Virtual LSA website. <laughs> website. Um, and some of those have already been uploaded. Thank you very much, Martin. And the remainder will be uploaded um, over the next um, few days and weeks. So thank you very much. I'm going to hand over um, to the head of department, uh, Professor Sharman Bandiopadi, who's going to introduce our guests tonight. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lucretia. Thank you very much. Uh, and good evening, everyone. And um, it gives me great pleasure in um, uh, really welcoming um, the two speakers for this evening, uh, Shida O'Donnell and John Toomey. Uh, O'Donnell and Toomey um, needs no introduction. Uh, it is one of the foremost architectural practices of the sort of early 21st century. 2015 gold medal. RIBA gold medal winners, uh, Sheila and uh, John both studied at the University College Dublin and graduated in 1976. After that, they had uh, they worked with uh, James Sterling's practice and uh, John worked on the Sats Gallery um, from the competition phase to the detailed design phase. Uh, and also uh, Sheila and John and various others, they worked with Cohen and Miller Spence and Webster, and in 19, uh, towards, uh, in 1980s, they set up, and this is a kind of really important, uh, you know, sort of uh, instruction for us in that, you know, how um, the sort of the more academic or the kind of more uh, discursive side of architecture can actually work together with the architectural practice side. So in 81, uh, I think in the early 80s, uh, John and uh, Sheila set up the, the Blue Studio architectural gallery, which was really a kind of instrument to push uh, architectural thought, rationalist thought, as well as the kind of the issues of regeneration and so on, um, urban regeneration uh, to the forefront. So that actually resulted in a group called Group 91, which in, uh, in 91 actually um, were commissioned to undertake this major work on the Temple Bar area regeneration uh, in Dublin. And uh, that was completed in the mid 1990s with a uh, couple of projects, of course, with Odol Natumi and various other projects happening there. But John also worked and sort of managed the entire project uh, on behalf of, uh, of that group. And to, they have also taught at different locations, different universities across the world, um, from Princeton to Michigan to Buffalo to Yale, Columbia, uh, Syracuse, various others, Vancouver, and yeah, uh, many, many locations, but also they have lectured in different locations across the world. So um, it is a great, with great pleasure that I welcome today, this evening, Sheila and John to talk about competition to construction. Um, it is promising to, go, to be a very, very exciting opportunity. And also could I actually take this opportunity to um, announce that Sheila and John has agreed to become uh, our visiting professors for the Liverpool School of Architecture. It's a great honor. Thank you, Sheila, and thank you, John, for agreeing to do that. And uh, we promise not to put too much uh, of a load and a pressure on you, but we will be in touch from time to time on that matter. But also everyone knows, and again, it needs no 
saying that uh, uh, O'Donnell and Toomey has been uh, undertaking this major uh, extension of our architecture building and we've been having several very intellectually uh, engrossing architectural debate about that and uh, we are looking forward to a really exciting building that will add to the character of the Liverpool School of Architecture. So over to Sheila and John. You're muted, I think. Yeah, I think we're... Okay. Hello, uh, we're delighted to be here. Uh, and thank you, Shimon. We're really happy to have been invited to be visiting professors in Liverpool. And we look forward to working with the school, with the students and with the staff that we've already been collaborating with on this project. And we're going to share when, um, um, when we won the competition for your school, uh, we had just about that time stopped teaching at what we call our school, you know, in Dublin, after many years as professors there. And I remember when we won your competition, Sheila said to me, now we have a new school of architecture to play. Um, I think it's kind of nice that, uh, that you've asked us formally to come and play in your school. Um, but, you know, we're, we're happy. We're happy to play. Um, what we're going to do tonight is we are going to um, talk you through the, the steps of um, the competition that we won for you in Liverpool and what we've done with it since, because we're just about to uh, make a planning application for that project. And then we're going to show you um, what happens after you win competitions that you have to build them. And we're going to show you two projects on, on site in, in London. So if I could uh, share my screen um, with you, I can, I should be able to get this started. And uh, we ought to be able to you tell me if you can see my slides. Yes. Yes, okay. we can. Thank okay, you. Okay, fine. Well, um, this is a worm's eye axonometric drawing, not drawn by hand, but drawn out of our building information modeling Revit computer system, with me insisting that it would closely resemble the kinds of worm's eye axonometrics I used to draw when I was working in Starling's office, because um, your school is the alma mater of our mentor, James Sterling. Now, both of us were, I'd say, um, grew close to him personally during the time that we worked there. And I think he treated us in, in, a, in a kind of a vuncular way. I think he um, expected something of us. And in a way, he sort of looked after us. Um, and we were very, very fond of him. And uh, Marco Giuliani sent me this photograph, and none of us re really know how this photograph could have come about, because what it is, of course, is a photograph of the original courtyard of your School of Architecture, with the whole school assembled, with one guy sitting out front with his knees pulled up, and that is James Sterling. We were wondering, how did he know he was going to be James Sterling? How did he pull himself out of the crowd and sit there in front of the flower bed with the sandals on? And Although Marco being the scholar he has, he might have 40 of these pictures with each person in turn coming forward and posing. But I don't know. Um, but we, of course we knew the whole tradition of the Liverpool School because Robert Maxwell, Colin Rowe, um, even down to contemporaries of ours in London like Patrick Lynch, we, we, we knew about the flow of uh, studio culture that has um, come forward out of that out of that school, and then when we went to your site, we discovered the presence of what we were calling the Riley Building, Charles Riley Building, that Sterling went to college in. <coughs> so this was a kind of you can imagine in our office when we got that invitation, it was a pretty exciting invitation. But you know the the courtyard that Sterling is sitting in the center of, if you just imagine. In these two photographs, these are now sitting directly on top of where Sterling is sitting, but that you later filled in the courtyard to create this lofty, what's now called your Sterling gallery, but to create this lofty top lit space, but you kind of suppressed 
the courtyard below it to make a rather dark space, which is a challenge. And it's, but it's an interesting one because those studios in the upper floors of your school in the 1930s building were of course top lit until the sort of spaceship um, landed. And it's very elegantly landed, that spaceship, you know, how it lightly connects into the architecture of the original building. There's, there's a lot to think about, about how that makes, the space that makes and the conversation that makes with the top lit school of architecture. And I guess the second aspect of the context, the physical context, let's say Sterling is the first aspect of the context, but that's cultural. And then the changing of the building is the second aspect of the context. But what really struck us when we went there, um, this was the photograph you can see we took on the first days we were there when it was raining. But it really struck us that there are no boundaries to the campus of your university. The university is uh, meshed with the city. And from the university campus, you're connected to the streets. And from within the university campus, you see out in different perspectives, this one um, to, to, the, to the cathedral. So we were interested in that relationship, town to town. And you, you have a master plan, which is what has positioned the possibility of this School of Architecture extension. And you can see in these drawings, if I can find a pointer here, somewhere, I look for a pointer. Um, coming up. You can see in these drawings that this was the block reserved for the extension of the School of Architecture. This was the idea of the block and how it relates to the cathedral. And, and yet when you put that block on, you can see that it, it has an effect on the corner of the building. If, if, we, if we adhered to the master plan, you would lose this wonderful feeling that you see inside that space, yeah. which we decided was our favorite space in your building, this corner studio. Well, that corner has really big importance both inside and out because it very much expresses the language of that building as being different from the Georgian building because the window goes around the corner. And then inside it has this wonderful spatial feeling of connecting you out to the campus beyond. So we really wanted to keep that somehow. But this was what we, this is, this is the kind of um, blank survey drawing of the, the context as we face it, which is the School of Architecture extends from all of these Georgian houses on the square and then into the, the what we still call the Riley Building, the Leverhulme Building, including where it says exhibition space, which used to be the courtyard and um, that Sterling and the rest of the students were sitting in. So this was the starting point and that room with the corner windows on the left there. And we were very struck when we were there by the sense of the routes and stairs and connections always seeming to feel blocked. But whenever you wanted to walk from one part to another, your route was blocked. Um, and then also that some of the, the rooms had been, by building, filling in the courtyard, the light in some of the studio was quite compromised by these small, high up windows, which um, you know, didn't create the most wonderful environment. And in fact, some of the studios weren't used very much because the students didn't really enjoy being in them. And then between the Georgian houses and the 1930s extension, there's a kind of enigmatic courtyard, um, but it has a presence and it has this very elegant little bridge across it. But the courtyard is, is underused and we thought maybe we should raise it up to the level where it can be better accessed and make a better connection. Sheila will speak a little bit about splints and splices and how buildings are connected. But you walk down the corridors either side of, the, of that filled in courtyard and it, you're lost to the world. Um, so we, our mission is to connect your school, to connect your school out to the campus and to connect your school within itself to its own, to its own um, organism. Well, I wanted to say something about the process because um, I think we both were so impressed with the competition process that's organized by um, Liverpool School of Architecture. Maybe it takes a School of Architecture to organize an architectural competition process, but it's unusual. And it, for those of you who weren't involved in this, 
It, it's a three-stage process. But the first two stages, you didn't really tell us anything. Um, you didn't tell us what the project was. You didn't tell us what the scale of the project was. You just to ask the invitees to respond to some questions. In the first stage, I think you wrote to 18 practices, or I'm not sure. And you asked each practice to submit a kind of statement about what their priorities might be in relation to university design. And we picked out of a body of our work, we picked out three projects to show you. University projects. One was a gallery that we built for the University College in Cork. And there we were trying to show that um, the building itself can involve the public space of the university, that the building can become a civic, a part of the civic journey of the university. And we showed you the project we had made for the London School of Economics for a student center. And there we were trying to emphasize that the street system of the campus can be pulled right into the architecture of the new building. And the third example we gave was a university project we had just recently finished in Budapest for the Central European University. And there the whole ambition was to pull the city right into the building and push university life right out into the city. So I think we staked our bid for your project on this idea of civic presence, civic realm, the kind of social interactive life of university campus, you know, the academic community of the university. Before we go on to stage two, I think what, what John hasn't said yet is that stage one, the structure was that everybody submitted to the media, it was five, eight, three sheets, and they were just exhibited in the school to the whole school community, staff and students. And everybody had a say, I think, as far as I know, it was a vote among the, the school community as to which of the entrants would move through to the next stage. And that was something that we were absolutely, you know, really impressed by the idea that that the, the selection of architect, first of all, that was based on general principles of discussion about themes, and secondly, that the whole school community was involved in that discussion and indeed in making the decision. And this came even more community. crucial in the next stage, when your students themselves became active. Mm. The next stage was you asked us to make five panels to submit. I think the first stage was three and the second stage was five. And at, at that time, you asked us about to illustrate kind of points of principle about five questions that, you know, quite specific questions that you asked, but they still weren't about your project. Um, and the first question was about place. You said, discuss or help us understand your relationship or your attitude to context and place making. So we showed here in, you know, in the, in the high uh, picture, in the big picture, we were trying to talk about scale and context and show the housing project that quite near our office in Dublin, where we tried to bring a sense of neighborhood, a sense of um, place, okay. But I think a, a sense uh, of connection between yeah. aspects of the context, which in this case was part early industrial and part residential. And so we have this uh, intention that the character of this residential neighborhood would reflect something of the, of the kind of early industrial and current housing and very much a kind of brick context. Of Maybe that's industry. feeling in places that we wanted the thing to feel as if it was belonging to what was already there, as if it emerged out of what was already there. And the second um, question that you asked was about space, um, about character, about atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So we were looking at, at the space we've made for the gallery in Cork and how by pushing an internal space out as if it's a portico that that kind of draws the whole university into the spatial into the spatial uh, experience I mean we're very you know we're very interested in space as well as place and your third question was about tectonics about uh, materiality tactile experience so we were thinking about brick and stone and concrete and timber and and our preference for working with um, malleable material. And, and self-finished materials that, that weather and, and have a develop a kind of patina in time rather than being shiny and permanently um, 
one way that somehow materials and buildings might show, might age gracefully rather than uh, fading, unfortunately. And then organization. Um, I think we're, I mean, this will come up when we start talking about the scheme for your project, but we're very interested in how the parts of a brief or a building come together, that the relationship between form and organization and the articulation of parts and how the articulation of the separate parts can give you a kind of, uh, the in-between space then becomes something very dynamic and very charged that sometimes our buildings almost feel like clusters of positive space collected around a kind of loose fit space of circulation and social engagement. And your last question, which is a crucial one for all of us practicing today, was the question of environmental responsibility. Um, which you attached weathering to as well, but that's what Sheila was just saying about time. And we were trying to show you how, you know, it's in our, it's in our uh, DNA, it's in our structure to try to think about reducing energy demand and to think about the buildings as having a long life of um, using as minimum energy through, through the way they wear and tear and through the introduction of daylight and through the use of natural ventilation and natural weathering. So what's interesting about all that is that you asked us those five questions and then it all got publicized. But what we hadn't realized is that the students became participants in, in, in the judgment. And indeed, as far as I understand it, you nominated students to be agents of each entrant. So that one of you had to, had to speak for us, you know, in our absence, and present us um, to the school. And then we ourselves have to come to the school and do that presentation to the jury. And to the school community. Yeah. A public jury presentation which is really interesting and different. And you had a great jury. I mean, I know you had your student jury, but you had a great external jury with Michael Wilford, Sterling's old partner. Um, Kenneth Frampton in the chair with his pal, Johanny Palazmo, and Maria Balcho from the, from the Tate Gallery. So you, you had a strong jury. And you can see the student observers are there keeping a close eye on the process all the time. And there's Frampton making his notes. I don't know who took these pictures, but because you know, we didn't break into the jury room. But Frampton making his detailed notes on as it happens on our scheme, and then announcing to us all that. that so at the end of yeah. the presentation day, they jury came back in and announced the winner. Mm. So it was a very, I suppose it was just a very theatrical process that was yeah. um, that was orchestrated by the school and um, you know very um, intense. So intense. I mean, I think for those of you, you know, we, we're architects in practice, and I know you're students of architecture in the main. But we just wanted to say to you that that it sort of never stops this feeling of, of continuously presenting and and uh, proposing your work, just like you do in crits in school that this life goes on, you know, you have to think of something, you have to hold a concept and you have to put it forward in the world. And that's really what this talk is about. So our first principle for the Liverpool School of Architecture is that based on the concept of place is the principle of from the ground up. We start with what we can find out of the culture, out of the geography, out of the place itself, and then through overlay drawings and through walking around and immersion in the place itself, we try to make something that feels like it grew up out of, a, out of the very place. In fact, the, you know, in our hope, the new work we make should feel even more archaic in its presence than the works that are there that are older than it, if you understand me. So that was move one. And the second principle is that we design from the inside out, which I suppose means that we spend a lot of time uh, analyzing and understanding the brief and not just the numbers in the brief, but the sense of what the uses and spaces in the building will be. And I suppose we know very well what schools of architecture are like having taught in one for 40 years. And um, so we really designed, so this drawing on the right is one of a number of drawings that I made while we were going through the process of making the plans and sections, which is really to think three dimensionally about how the spaces in this building would work and how there would be a kind of connective flow between the introductory space, which is a kind of meeting hall, a gathering space for exhibitions, for events, for discussions, 
and then that the studios above would overlap and connect with that and that there will be places on staircases to stop and talk and that there will be moments of connection between the old and the new. So we're really trying to make the architecture of the place grow out of what it's like to be inside it. So, all, so and I suppose in the School of Architecture, the studio in your school, as in the one we used to teach in, the studio is the key space in the building. It's where the teaching and the learning happens. And it's often where the teaching of one student to another or where students learn from each other happens. So there is a kind of um, intensity about that space. And we're thinking about top light and timber structure, defining a kind of tent-like space or a series of interconnected spaces that then look down to other levels of studio below. And then John mentioned earlier about the interest in man or connection. And for us, the, the challenge of connecting these three different, um, the, the two stages and then the new parts of the building was really interesting. And so part, one thing we did was to um, think about tidying up. I mentioned earlier about the, the, the lack of clarity in the existing connection. So we made we opened up aspects of routes up through the existing Georgian houses to make a clearer route. And we relocated lifts and stairs to make routes that would work, that tied the different parts together. And then the yellow bits we saw as being kind of slices or splints that connect the Georgian houses to the, um, the Riley building, so it's in the, the next plan. And then that we pulled our building back at this corner so that that corner we've spoken about of the existing um, the corner window in the Riley building would be retained and visible and in a way would kind of oversee the entrance. So you come into this tapered crack between the old building and the new and that makes a set. This is the splice which goes right up through the building and every level makes different kinds of connections in plan and in section. So we really are sort of stapling the old and new and you can see it in the section below. The slight level changes are dealt with in ramps and we we kind of celebrate the moment of connection and that happens between the, the old and the new, the, the older and the middle aged building, let's call it also. But what we're trying to do then is to make, to keep the plan that's there, but to make a kind of clear order out of it. So on the ground floor, we've opened up a series of small workshops and work areas and booths, which are all part of the technical uh, workshops of the schools and open out onto a yard at this stage on the left. The gathering space here, and then uh, small small workrooms for for postgraduate groups on the street and offices and spaces that work within the scale of the Torkin House. And then we have to try to ensure that um, we have to try to ensure that these things work together. So we're trying to bring the whole thing down to ground, and we chose to say that we would build it in brick because the Georgian houses are brick. The Riley building is brick, so. Ours is a brick building, and then we wanted to set it down in a brick, in a brick ground. For those of you who can look very closely at drawings, you'll find these drawings are full up in these black and white figures. They're full up of dead architects, of hero architects, except for these four guys here who are the Beatles, who, as you know, are not architects, but they're from Liverpool. Um, and we were very concerned to try to show this hybrid structure of how the timber um, bonnet would sit on the concrete table as part of the tectonics of the building. And that has somehow survived. And the last principle of our presentation was about reducing demand, about making natural weathering materials, about thermal mass, about light and ventilation, and the whole principle of how a long lasting building can pay for its construction, so to speak, by being responsible about the way it relates to the natural environment. I mean, um, we're thinking about the corner that we talked about at the beginning and how that's kept in the new extension, but not, you know, kept, respected, becomes the point of entry and um, finds a new life in the school. And we looked a lot at where the daylight used to come, you know, in the in the original courtyard, how it has been compromised by the by the flying in extension, and then how we might through some acupuncture, you know, we might remove the um, we might remove the obstacle and open the building to the outside. So that was our competition entry. And as I say, the principle of the competition entry was predicated on 
the master plan for the university, where the architecture would face Abercrombie Square, but it would also face this new central square inside on campus. And in our developed design, which is, um, as I say, planning application ready, it's exactly two years is it, since we won the competition. Happy birthday. Um, we're two, but it has taken a while um, to try to make sure that the principles of our project serve the school as well as it can, survive as much as they can, and can be afforded by the university as much as it can afford. So we're thinking about the relationship of this new green space at the center of the university with the cathedral and how the School of Architecture creates a face to that new space. Um, we're thinking about the entrance. If you, if you follow my pointer, if you're coming in between that corner studio into the new entrance in the, in the splice between the old and new. And if you walk in the door, you're in a kind of connected space, walk to one side and you walk in under the table of the gathering space, the one that relates out to the green space. This presentation will concentrate on the new extension because that's the part we get to build first. But of course, it is all one connected school. And I think we're both really, I mean, you saw Sheila's first sketches for this part, but we're both really excited about this idea that there's a civic space that kind of belongs to the university. And there's been, it's interesting, and in a way there's been a lot of development and discussion with the school and with the university about how this and lots of changes have occurred, but I think we're happy that the character and the spirit of what we proposed in the beginning survives this process and is now, as John said, approved for going to planning. And this, here you see that, that the gathering space and the first mezzanine is a kind of crit, um, a crit tutorial space that overlooks that, and then as you go up, you come up to more studios uh, overlooking where the rest so, uh, well, I'm going to emphasize this, this little bridge here that, you know, you see how it sort of drops into the scheme at, at not connected levels. It's just a mezzanine floating in the, in the gathering space, but it has a very active effect um, in the section. So let's say in the section, everything above the table is studio and below the table is, is collective, you know, university wide space the school's connection with the campus. But if you drop the mezzanine, like we have done, you know, drop it in the section, then the mezzanine becomes the connection between the civic space and the studio space. Well, you get a sort of series of, you know, interconnected views, with, but also it gives an element of a kind of separation but connection mm -hmm. at the same time. We're kind of excited um, about that, and we think it'll make a really yeah. powerful and then there are lots of um, these, this, this, the tutorial space. There are, there are sort of small spaces and big spaces that all work, that are connected to each other within that. Um, and then at first floor level, at the existing Sterling um, gallery level, you just connect directly studio to studio. So if you were to walk from your existing studio through the splice space, you would arrive in the studio like this, and you, you, if you, you see out the bay window, you see to the cathedral in the, in the distance, which is all these geometries are to do with urban views and urban dynamics. Um, and on the top floor, you connect again with the, with the sterling upper floor levels to, to the top studio, which looks down into this volume. Maybe this goes back to your competition. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think one, one thing we've been working on a lot, of course, is the timber structure of the roof. And I think, again, we feel happy that we have managed to work something out that, that retains the character that we were uh, working on then. But I think maybe that long section is about just, I mean, our, our um, motto for this was a connected campus or a connected school. So connection was always the thing we, we felt that when you're extending a building, it's already been extended twice, that connection is a really important thing. So just a sense of movement from the Georgian house through the middle stage and then into the new part that somehow one, you should recognize it from parts. But if you're a student or a tutor in the school, you should also feel you're in a singular place that is one big connected world. And you can just as easily go and have a seminar in the Georgian house at the back of your desk in the new studios on the left without feeling 
a complete sense of disconnect. And the elements of our project are the same as the elements of the Abercrombie Square and the Riley Building transformed. In other words, that you have a brick volume with a roof, you know, with a roof hat. So you now have three in a row and they're all connected to each other. And so inside in the, you know, so to speak, attic of this new space is the, is the um, crucible of, of the tablet studio of the new school of architecture. So this is what we, this is where we have got two years later, this is where we have got, we've got to where we started um, by an, an extremely rigorous process. Um, and uh, we think it survives. We survive and it will happen this way. So just to kind of go backwards and forwards, this we won a competition in, I think actually six years ago in 2015 for uh, a new cultural education and residential quarter in East Bank, which is a piece of land, uh, which is part of Lon the site of the London Olympics. It's interesting that Showman mentioned earlier about that, that we started our careers with the Temple Bar Cultural Quarter. And when this project was advertised as a new cultural quarter for London, we thought, wow, we've been, and we've been working on a lot of cultural buildings and done theatres since then, and also on educational buildings. It sounded like an amazing dream project, but we thought it might be hard to, to get. But an interesting aspect of the structure of this competition was that you were invited to join, architects were invited to form teams of a number of practices, at least three was specified, of different sort of scales and ages. So we worked with Allies and Morrison, who are very well established uh, London practice, and with Architecturia, who are a young practice based in Spain, much younger and much smaller. And together we worked on the master plan and came up with a proposal for these. There are four cultural buildings, um, one of which is also education, and about four or five hundred apartments. So it's a big project on a very long, narrow strip of land that is the kind of size and proportion of an aircraft carrier. I suppose the reason for thinking of that, it's also a piece of land that deals with a really peculiar level change. And you can see these, these are two side photographs with on the left, the, the, stair, the Sadler's Wells Dance Theatre, it's, it's concrete core going up, and on the right is the um, new museum for the BNA, which are the two buildings that we're working on. But in both cases, the, the BNA on the photo on the right, you can see there's a podium which is eight metres above the level of the river and the walkway along the River Lee. And that comes about because of the way that the Olympics um, was run, that they had parcels of land connected by big bridges and all the transport went through underneath. So I'm going to start by talking about one of the two buildings we're designing, which is the Sadler's Wells Dance Studios. And um, it's, it was well, a dance theatre and an academy of dance. And it sits on the one corner of the site uh, where the entrance from this very big raised bridge is, which is on the right of that picture. And you can see that from that bridge, you look down eight metres to the level of the river below. And the building kind of straddles these two level changes. The public enter at this upper level of the podium. And this perspective gives a sense of the kind of character. It's a brick building. It has an almost industrial character. We talked a lot with the client in the early stage of what kind of place they want. And they wanted a building that feels ready for work, a, a building where dance is made and conceived and taught as well as being performed. So they wanted not to be a kind of glitzy theatre, but to be much more uh, welcoming for everybody. And if anyone could feel they could come in and be part of the world of making dance. This drawing shows that section I referred to on the right is the aquatic centre from the Hadith building in the Olympics, which is directly opposite on this, what's, what is now a bridge. So our building, the public enter at this level into the foyer, from which you go into the top of the auditorium, which drops dramatically down then to the stage, which is at road level. So the stage and the get in and all the backstage stuff is at a road level and the public enter above here. And so that it sort of straddles that relationship. And then there are terraces that look out over the rest of the Olympic site. When we were trying to think about what is, what is you know, this building, what typology is it, what form does it have? Um, we were trying to think how to deal with six dance studios and an auditorium and other parts. And a really interesting part of the brief is that all of the rooms were defined in the brief as being having right angled corners. They had to be rectangular or square because of the way that dance is taught and studied. They couldn't have rooms with angles. So we were looking at these diagrams for choreo choreography diagrams that show how to make a dance move. And really like this sense of the, using the black and white to the left and right to give a sense of rhythm and repetition and movement. So 
we came up with the idea that the dance studios would each have these pitched roofs, a north light roof, and that they would, one group is facing south over the river and the other group is facing uh, east to the aquatic centre, and that they turn the corner around the bar, which is the sort of circulation and service bar of the building. So we're trying to make the building, which is square and has all these right angles, have a kind of a, a rhythm within its simplicity. So we studied that in model and we studied it in drawings. And this model, I mean, below the, the podium, this is the podium level, and there's a lot of stuff below there, which is sold at the backstage and the get in and stuff. But what the public see from this side is that amount. And then we're thinking about the materials as being a kind of clay, clay brick, clay tiles, and then a lot of glass where the foyer and the studios are. Uh, the first floor studios, we have a big canopy that projects outwards. So while they have a lot of glass, you can't actually see into them from below. The, the canopy creates a kind of screen. And anyway, we have sunshades, which also give a layer to the studio. So the studios are well lit, but they're not, you can't see the people inside very much. And then the section, just moving back, the section behind that is simply three rooms with top light. Uh, below that, two more studios here and here, which are the ones with the big windows because they don't have the top light. And then the foyer, which wraps around two sides. At one point, we, we omit a studio and the foyer becomes double height. And from the walkways and the gathering place for students, you can look down into the public realm of the foyer below. So it's a kind of interlocking section, again, made up very much of these um, cubic forms. The auditorium is flexible so the seats can all retract and give you a huge flat floor space with a very high fly tower because the dance uses a lot of props and sets and they need to disappear completely and then the stage is very big. So there's a, there's a, the character of the auditorium is as a kind of working space so when the seats move back it's like a big rectangular hole and above that the biggest studio is also a place that can be used for public uh, performance, which opens onto a terrace, and then there's the, the foyer and the admin. So it's a it's a kind of simple building. And then in relation to the site and the context, it's it's a joins on the left. It's a BBC, so it's kind of semi-detached with the new building for the BBC that Allies and Morrison are designing. So our building, the foyer wraps around two public sides of the auditorium. And this sketch, I suppose, in a way, is about the idea that the foyer is actually a set of interconnected spaces that are all one space, but also have corners and places for people to stand aside. There's a space in the corner here for community dance. There's a small uh, coffee bar here, a much bigger bar and cafe here. With the idea that there are, it's a kind of, it's a, it's a dynamic, maybe sort of dancing set of spaces that can be occupied by hundreds of people or by a very small number of people, because you can find your own corner in which to sit. And then it's always open on the two sides out to the public spaces on, on both sides. And in a way, that's, that is what the building is. So the top section shows that double height I talked about. The brick material runs into the foyer and runs above the bar um, and the counters. And then you can, from, from up above, you can look down over that brick wall into the foyer. And then on the south side, we have this canopy that I mentioned, which is quite complex and has a green roof and lets light through and gives a covered space for people to gather and eat and drink on the south side, but also gives the screening to the studios. And in the middle, there's a terrace, there's a terrace off two of the studios that opens onto that, which also overlooks the double height space. So what we've enjoyed is taking this very rect rectangular plan and then trying to enrich its edges and the way it's made and its material quality. So you can see the two studios and the fly tower. And then at the top floor, there's four studios, a big one facing east here onto the terrace and three in a row there wrapped around the sort of solids of the, the backstages and other areas. And then as we were working on the building, it became clear, I mean, it's always interesting about theatres that you don't want windows. And then especially if it's got a big fly tower. Uh, so we were trying to think, how do we make a building in brick, which is solid and doesn't have very many windows? So we started, first of all, thinking about three dimensional things about, this is a ventilation chimney from the stage, which is expressed on the outside as a cobalt brick element. And there's a stairs which connects the upper level down to the road below and we've chamfered the corner of the entrance so we're trying to kind of work the brick three dimensionally but we're still trying to think about the language and how does this building express itself and then in the middle of this we were on a trip to rome um, one january and we were walking around the aurelian walls and we thought wow the aurelian walls really feels just like a whole series of fly towers joined together by this incredible wall and that gave us a kind of confidence that brick can be used uh, because of its uh, scale and its texture and its character, that it can be used in solid 
especially if you recess and projectors we're doing here. So we started quite early working with the brick with brick detailing with the with actually an Italian. This this is a company just north of Venice, Sant'Anselmo, who makes bricks, and we we spent a lot of time getting samples made back in the days before COVID when you could travel to look at bricks. And so we we they made a lot of samples in Italy, and we looked at them, and they so we're using a combination of big flat clay tiles and bricks made of the same clay, and then sometimes of projecting bricks. And these guys here are making the specials. And now with COVID, uh, samples just get delivered to our house. So our front garden is becoming a kind of sample yard. And these are the more recent. Uh, this is more like the color of the bricks will be a kind of purple color that these are, are the latest samples of the bricks which we're checking at home. So this is the most solid side, the side that the, the north side that faces the road that has fly tower. And as you, but as you approach from the bridge, you see that to the right, but you see the entrance ahead of you. And then as you move around to the south building, the more open side and on the public, the foyer level, it's completely open visually. So you can see into all the different activity spaces of the building. And then the sign over the door, which says you are welcome which the client wanted to put instead of the name of the building, because they're just really keen that the local community would engage with the activity in this building. So the second part of, I mean, winning that competition, Sheila reminds me of six years ago. Uh, winning that competition was a huge event in, for us because it, it was a scale of um, urban engagement um, that was very interesting with other architects and landscape makers and local authorities. It's also a very civic minded project, you know, in the public with a dedication to the public space. But it has these um, collection of public buildings to go with it, which we distributed among ourselves as architects. Um, uh, so it becomes a collaborative venture, but it's also very dedicated, as Sheila has just discussed, for the Sadler's Wells, and, um, and I'm going to talk to you about the museum we're making for the v &A, now known as v &A East. So it's the first purpose-made building in London that the v &A have developed. They built a new museum in Scotland, but now they're building one in Stratford. And it looks out across the park. It's public at all of its levels, and it, it tries to open its collections to um, public display. Um, we, we, you have to start somewhere. And um, when you're asked to design the VNA, um, you can't take on you know, too much at once because it's an enormous, it's an enormous institution. So we went for a walk in Dublin and uh, into the gallery, the National Gallery, and we were looking at this painting of the Johannes Vermeer, the only Vermeer in Ireland's national collection. And um, we were discussing it and Sheila was saying, look at the, look at the sleeve of the letter writer. Um, isn't that in itself an amazing kind of spatial contraption? I wonder what that would be like, you know, to inhabit. So it's just, I think, a passing comment but I got, um, Sheila tells me now that I picked the wrong sleeve anyway, but I got involved in the idea of trying to imagine the spaces inside that sleeve, or rather to think about protection, you know, the clothes a building must wear to protect its contents, and then the space between that protective skin and the body within. So I had kind of speculated about this a little before in a book that I, wrote some 20 years ago about some of our kind of principles. And I was referring to this conversation between Wim Wenders and Noji Yamamoto about, about the effect of tailored, tailored garments and the feeling that Wim Wenders had of putting on the jacket Yam, uh, of Yoji's jacket and feeling that he was wearing, yes, the jacket itself. It's a question of identity and uh, and presentation to the world. So, well, for those of you who haven't seen it, there's a wonderful film that Ben Bender has made about how Yoji Yamamoto works. And, it, you know, it's very, it's a studio way of working, like making models or interfering with the work just before it gets finished, very like the way we work ourselves. Um, and at the same time, the DNA had an exhibition as it happens. You're going to think I'm interested in frocks, fashion. but I'm not interested in that. But I, 
I'm interested in making and how people, I am interested in tailoring and how things are put together. And anyway, there's a wonderful exhibition at the VNA about um, the Spanish Couturier Balenciaga. And the London photographer, Nick Basie, had taken a photograph, one of his X-ray photographs of these Balenciaga costumes. And you suddenly see the external form and the internal structure. And I thought, why don't we kind of X-ray our building, you know, thinking about that for a mirror. So we developed a kind of new way of drawing in the office where we drew form and structure together as in X-ray to develop the concept for the v &A. Um, and oddly enough, you know, I mean, at the time that seemed to us like, like an idea or like a way to communicate an idea to a very large organization of multi, um, multi-interested parties, such as is represented at the v &A, where you have to clarify the concept. But then when you come to build it, you know, it turns out to be that, you know, it's, you kind of x-ray it intellectually and then it gets built by skeletal, form um, and will eventually then, that skeletal form will then eventually be skinned and the museum will be protected. So it's at an incredible stage at the moment, though, which will never be seen, but who, whoever sees through an x-ray. And so then, and the skin that goes on is a concrete skin, solid, solid skin um, that holds the museum safe. And then that opens its doors at, at the lower levels to, to, invite, um, to invite the audience in. So you have to imagine a building that, if you like, is encrusted in this, in this config um, envelope, the jacket itself. And then inside it are the bones and organs of the, of the operation of the museum. And in and out in the depth of that thickened wall, um, the people are moving. You know, the, the visitors are moving through the museum in the mural stairs and in the bay windows and in the thickness. That's the sort of free space before you enter the dedicated space of the curated world of the exhibition. Um, the whole thing, because it's public at every level, um, you've got to be able to go from top to bottom without entering dedicated exhibition spaces, but still being in the museum. So the journey through the building, well, from those of you who've been to the Original DNA, you know that the staircases are the marvelous spaces in the old DNA. So we wanted to make sure that the visitors' connections were part of the action. And we made some study models in section and volumetrically to try to think about the thickness of that wall and how the be in the in-between space, what the what the Japanese call the, the ma, you know, the space between the fabric and the form. And the, inside to outside in a public space. So when you're inside in the thickness of this crust, you see out to the stadium, you see out to the river. And we began to think about how to make it. Um, how do you build a thing like this? Which is, if you like, conceptually driven, but has to be material in its back. So a simple notebook sketch um, about how to agitate a line produced a kind of V and A idea about a groove and a promontory that would give a scale to the material. And I can show you that, you know, that's the, that's the body that's been protected inside. And this is the, the jacket that is protecting it outside. And we tried to draw all over that and, and score all over that, you know, to, as if it were in a way like a giant pot or something. And then when we come to make it, it has been extremely interesting to find in the precast concrete workshops to find a kind of exquisite precision of craftsmanship, which goes beyond stonework, I think, because we're making enormous pieces of stone made, you know, concrete with stone content in them. And then they have this shadow like shadow recess ridge and um, recess geometry that's extremely precise. I don't know, 400 pieces of concrete, not, none of them the same, and yet all of them made in the workshop. So it just occurs to me when Sheila said that we won this competition six years ago, I think the DNA opens in 2023. So it's just possible that the Liverpool School 
which we won much later, will win the race. Um, and that when we are swanning around as professors in your school, your finished school, that we can make the tour down to London to see how these things turned out. Um, so actually that's what we wanted to show you today. We wanted to show you that all we do really is try to, having thought of an idea, all we do is try to hold that idea to be the person, you know, to be the human who holds the thought all the way through an extremely complicated process between conception and construction. Um, and I think in a way the architect, although architects' roles have changed and profession, you know, is, is, a, is in a stress, the architect still is responsible for the transference of that thought into the finished, into the finish. Um, the architect carries the flame. Uh, all right, that concludes our, our, our presentation and I can stop sharing and it's back to you, Lucretia. Thank you so much, John and Sheila. That was fascinating. I really particularly enjoyed that last comment that you made that the architect is responsible for the process, for seeing it go, as you very um, clearly said in your in your title, from competition through to construction. And obviously, there's a lot of uh, ramifications and, and kind of intricate things that have to be dealt with in between. Um, and you articulated that so well. I really love the process. One of um, the comments in the chat was that clear articulation of process, particularly with the VNA and with our own school. So thank you so much for sharing those um, three um, really insightful and really interesting competitions that are at various stages um, moving through to construction. Um, we've had a couple of questions um, that have come through um, and I wondered if you would um, be able to answer some of them. Uh, one of the questions I think has possibly a little bit of a larger question so I'm going to start off um, by giving you that but then giving you another one and you can kind of um, think about uh, the first at the beginning. Um, I think that you have shown uh, through that um, process of competition through to construction a variety of um, renders and ways of expressing and communicating to client, to stakeholders, to the public um, your ideas um, and to us um, today. Um, and uh, one of uh, our, our, our listeners, um, Cathal, has said that they particularly enjoy the soft renders. Um, and um, when, uh, they asked whether you prefer the soft rendering or the, um, the computer graphic or the, the hand render. And I think um, we had a, a lecture yesterday where that was actually really um, questioned whether the, the idea of the CGI image is kind of fading out and should be faded out. Um, and so I'm interested to hear your response to that, but I think that's something you maybe have to think about. So um, I'm going to ask the other question um, and then you can maybe decide amongst you um, who's going to take on which of the questions. Um, our other question is from um, one of our uh, staff here, um, Dr. Jamila Quattroni, who has asked, um, I think there's maybe a little bit of uh, Italian here. Um, and she's curious to know why the brick samples was uh, manufacturing was carried out in Italy. Well, that, that's, a, that's a simple uh, one. Yes, yes, they were carried out in Italy. Um, so we, we've been working quite closely with the brick company in Italy who, uh, because they, it's a very interesting brick factory. It's very, very big. It produces an awful lot of bricks, but it also is very interested still in the hand, uh, handmade bricks and handmade tiles. And um, just have been very interesting to work with. Now we're hoping that they're the bricks that are going to be in the building. It's always very difficult to, until the last minute to be absolutely sure of what does end up in the building. But yes, uh, we worked, our team actually made a lot of really detailed drawings of, the, of what kind of, so we, we got that sample that I showed a photograph, we got that made almost like a, it's like a little element in itself, like a little piece of sculpture that just in, in, incorporates lots of different kinds of brick we want to put into the building. So it has a pointy bit and it has the projecting bricks and it has the big, uh, the big tiles because we just want to see how they all work together. And we're, so yes, they, they're, it is Italian. And the one, those brick samples in our front garden um, are, have been shipped over from Italy. 
which actually has turned out since Brexit to be quite good because we can get samples much more quickly to us from Italy than we can from, from Britain. Okay, so uh, you know, speed you realize, is... Lucretia, you realise that both your questions are the same, I mean, in a way, because they're both completely concerned with the idea of craftsmanship or craft. And I, I, I mean, when I was talking about tailoring, I, I think that's how we think. We think of ourselves, you know, as tailor, tailor-made solutions or something. We like that feeling that we fit the thing. So when she was talking about shaping the bricks or even meeting the makers of the bricks and learning how they do it and then adapting to what you learned from them to do it better. Um, so craftsmanship in relation to drawing, we still call them drawings, whether they're images or renders or whatever. But there's a craftsmanship in all of that. You know? and that's why I was trying to emphasize what we're doing with the precast concrete at the end, because we would have had the idea that prefabrication factory made, you know, might, might reduce the commitment of the craftsman on site. But of course, what it does is that it just makes the careful work happen somewhere else, like boat building. You don't build a boat in the sea, you build a boat in a workshop and then you bring it to the sea. So we've, you know, intellectually, we've kind of bridged this ourselves, this distance. So Sheila makes watercolor studies, which, you know, I don't go near except to admire them. I, I draw still the same as I did when I was a student, but so does Sheila, but mm. the same paper, that we, you know, we just the work the way we work. But the amazing thing about building information modeling and working in three dimensions with our colleagues in the studio is that you can get your head right inside the thing, you know, when it's still in virtual. So we don't worry anymore about, there is no war between the technologies. That, you know, probably it, when we were originally getting used to working with computers in the office, not that we personally drive the BIM, I'm afraid we don't, but it was, it did seem like an other thing. And then I like to say that most of the, now most of the watercolor drawings I do are based on um, working with someone on the 3D model, selecting a view, moving it around to get the right view, and then they print it out and I somehow transfer it or trace it or turn it into a watercolor. So it's a kind of collaboration between um, computer generated and hand drawn. The reason, I mean, so, and then sometimes at the early stage, they're much more sketchy and they don't have that. And I really like that because what I like about working with watercolor is that the, that the watercolor itself has a, it has a material quality. You know, it's, a, it's pigment dissolved in water sitting on paper and when it dries in a way, it still exists as a layer. A bit like graphite does too when you draw in pencil. And I think that if you're thinking about making a building, you're actually, you can see the materials of the drawing in some way relate, like I think the watercolor pigments a bit like the bricks or something, you know, it's powder that ends up in, in the same things. Also, I think in, if you're doing watercolor sketch drawings, you don't have much detail in them, you can convey a sense of atmosphere and uh, through the kind of color and texture, which comes across in a drawing without having to show where all the windows are, but you can show light and shade. So I think it's very, I find it a very appropriate medium for working at the sort of schematic level of like master plans like I did a lot on the original stage in the early stages of the East Bank which used to be called Olympicopolis the um the, the cultural quarter in London I at the time of the competition I used a lot of watercolors to just get an overview on the whole massing um, so I think yes John said we I mean I would agree I think we do feel that CGI there's a point now where people want really photorealistic CGI's of everything. And I think when they become really photorealistic, they're sometimes less realistic, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And I, I think that is a loss because I also think it takes some kind of autonomy that the image is not being made and controlled by the architect and isn't about the idea. It's about an imagined idea of the reality, but you know, you know what the reality be like, all right. And sometimes it becomes in the end, then people want them, you know, they're saying, can we have one of the corridor that leads to the toilet? And you say, well, why do we don't need a CGI of the corridor that leads? Well, we want to know what it's like. You say, well, we'll tell you, the floor is, uh, is marmoly and the walls are painted black work and the doors are, you know, hardwood or something. You say, oh, I can't really imagine that. I need a picture. So I think there's a, they, they have made people very needy 
you know, people are very needy of those kind of images, whereas... Oh, but they always have. I mean, yeah, but, you know, but, you don't, you can't think about John Soane's work without thinking about Gandhi's okay, paintings. Okay, John, so that's an exception, but you know, probably... You know, everyone had a picture made. Riley right? probably did the whole school of architecture on one big A0 sheet. He probably had plans, sections, the elevations, and some detail of the material. And I would say that what, I mean, I would say if I was thinking about it, this as an advice, if you like, about practice, and I would say that you should try and draw every day. I mean, that's what we do when we're not <laughs> discussing. <laughs> you know, we, do, we both of us draw the whole time. That's fantastic. Um, I've got quite a few other questions, so I'm going to steer us back on um, to another question now. Um, one of our questions has been about how you ensure the quality and your intention, which you spoke about quite a lot, um, about wanting that thought to continue all the way through. How do you deal with that through the value engineering and the detailed design process when there are other pressures on the wider design team? Um, so what are the must stay elements for you? Do you identify those? Um, and how do you kind of retain those as, as part as you move through the project? Well, I think you probably wouldn't be able to imagine how dogged we are. I mean, we, I mean, we're dogged to the point of stupidity, I think. We're just the people who came back into the meeting and saying, but really, I think it should, don't you really, don't you all really think it should be like this? And eventually either you just wear them down or, or, or you bring them around um, or they just get tired of you um, and give up. But I think that you must make your ideas so kind of clear that they can be adopted and loved by, not by you, but by others. You know, you've got to make everybody feel that they're part of the understanding of what's about to happen. And everybody has a role in that. Every builder, every carpenter, every quantity surveyor, every engineer is part of what will eventually become, you know, embodied in the actual building. So we try to keep from the very beginning, we try and think about the welfare of the building mm -hmm. and become its guardian. That's what I meant about um, keeping the flame, you know, you live for it. But that's not to say, you know, we do have to go through value engineering and, and, and we do have to knock huge amounts of money off the buildings that we're doing. And so in a way, you do need to have a sort of from the outset, you need early on to get a shared aspiration with the clients and the other people. So you all kind of value things. But then I, I think trial and error, I mean, that's the thing about being dogged. It also means often an awful lot more work because you have to think, okay, so we are going to get half a million off this. And you know, for example, say in the Sadler's Wells building, at one point it was all handmade bricks. And then I think, no, we've got to do machine bricks. And we went to lots of brick companies and we tried to keep use the hand wave bricks where we absolutely have to where they're very special specials and then really work with the maker to say we need the same clay in these bricks and they do a sample say no it's not good enough no so there is a lot there's an awful lot of toing and froing and going back and it probably is it's not that you would it's not that there's something general that you'd identify as being what we have to protect in every project you have to work out what you need to protect in its own terms as you go along so in one building, it might be the bricks and another building, it might be something else about floor or the space and or the height of a room. Uh, but but I, we you do also have to, don't you have to convince the, yourself that, that it's worth fighting for. You know, you have to be able to say it out loud and it not to sound too foolish, you know. But then also, I would you say, have to say that, it has to be like that. John is quite good at also, you know, he suddenly says, OK, I've locked a huge bit off that. And I go, what? Yeah. He says, it's better, isn't it? Yeah. And I said, is it? He said, yeah, it's definitely better. I've done this and we're saving whatever. So the well, other I, thing I'm is, happiest, you, I'm happiest when I'm cutting back. You have to. I'm yeah. a cut backer. So yeah. maybe you have to always believe there's a little bit of fat in everything you do and that there is room to <laughs> find the fat. But you, yeah. you have to be happy with what. So it is, it's a tricky one. And you do have sleepless nights over it. And um, there's a lot of to improve and compromising with everyone on the team, including sometimes with each other here. That's cruel. That's a cruel. It's a cruel. Why did you bring that up? That was a horrible thing. <laughs> well, I've got another tricky question for you, to be <laughs> honest. Um, considering the increasing awareness of the construction sector's climate mm -hmm. impact in the recent yeah. years, um, how the over the six year long design process of the VMA, yeah. um, your choice of prefab concrete, and I know this has come up um, with regards to our own extension with the choice yeah. of concrete. Um, yeah. 
what extent has that climate impact been part of, or the climate impact and the, and the emergency yeah. crisis that we're in yeah. been part of the discussion and been something that you have been determined that has to stay rather than potentially looking for alternatives that's so that's so true i mean i think that the you know probably everything in our training if you can allow us to draw on that for a second everything in our training has been to make sure that the way buildings operate in the world is is with is in a responsible way in relation to nature so ancient buildings that we are inspired by you know are filled with natural light natural air and they last forever and we see our buildings as i said in our introduction we see our buildings as if you like archaic already you know we want them to last we don't we, we're not building for the short term but the the recent crisis is such that it's not just a question of how well the buildings will operate in time it's a question of the impact they make now through their own construction and the embodied carbon um, that is you know the product is it's integral to that construction so we have to build we have to provide the space we have to meet the needs of our clients but we are trying to like everybody is i think we are trying to adapt ourselves to this change to this change in awareness i don't think there's any architect working who isn't struggling with this issue because a building must have foundations and the only way we know to make foundations is to make them in concrete. A building must have structure that is stable against, you know, everything that the world throws at it. And the only way we can do that is by stabilizing things with reinforcement or cross bracing or especially multi-story um, multi construction. So we're all the time in this balance between the benefits of thermal mass and, and long, longevity versus the impact of, you know, the disruption caused by construction itself. So we, I mean, we're trying with our engineers to reduce the cementitious content of our construction. We're trying to reduce um, the over design of steel and the over use of supported products. We're, um, we're trying to make sure that we design against obsolescence, that we design flexible, adaptable structures that don't need to be taken down or replaced. But I would say that this conversation has really um, taken off in the last, yeah. you know, three or four years. And mm. so I think those buildings in London, you know, they've been, well, that was six years ago, they won the competition. They probably you know, went to tender three and a half, four years ago. And actually, I would say since then, a lot of change has occurred. But those buildings are designed and tendered. And as John said, I think we have a very strong sense about, uh, about natural materials, about the, the, um, the, the embodied heat in the building, et cetera, and the natural ventilation. But we're now working a lot, say, on other projects and looking at, I mean, there are serious issues, it's quite difficult working with mass timber, which we've been trying to do on other projects. Uh, I think uh, one problem is that the building regulations aren't completely um, up to date with with what the potentials for building in timber are it's actually quite difficult to build especially in britain higher than three stories using timber using structural timber because the regulations are so difficult particularly fire uh, so and i think also you know we're, in the research we're doing in projects that are currently on the boards there's a lot of discussion about clt and then people questioning what the clt actually is as as wonderful in terms of its carbon footprint as is being said so I think so one of the issues of course is, is um, the, the um, research that's going on all over the world for example into finding different versions of concrete which have a different level um, of embodied carbon so I I think that the discussion is you know, there was a time two or three years ago that it was more or less concrete bad timber good but I don't know that that's I think it is a complex conversation the building we're doing for Liverpool is a composite structure of timber um, above concrete. But we don't, I, I think it's it's an ongoing thing and it's obviously completely on our minds as it is on everybody's mind at the moment. And it's a, it is the issue that we move uh, into further building in the 21st century. 
But I would I, I, maybe maybe another answer is quite a lot of our work is involved in reuse of buildings. You know, we're very committed to that and always have been all our practice. So yeah. the extent to which we try to promote the adaptation rather than the demolition. And also I'd recycled materials, which is principle. something with, with our school in Ramos uses all recycled bricks. We have tried. But, but it's a, yeah, okay, Sheila's right. It's a very complex question. It's, but it's, it's, yeah. it's there and there's no question yeah. that it is at the top yeah. of every agenda yeah. now. Yeah. And yeah. it is the issue for architects and students of architecture, but actually, uh, you could, I'm sure there, are, I know there are people who might have been, it might have been their issue many years ago, but I think for us, it's probably an issue that has come to the fore in the last few years and is definitely uh, the work that's, that's, that's on the boards at the moment for us is very much, um, that's very much on, on the agenda and as it always has been, but now in a much more um, clear way. Thank you very much. Um, I think it is a difficult question. Obviously, there's no doubt mm -hmm. about that. Um, and um, I think your process that you were talking about there, I think it's very interesting that you're using that um, to guide your decision making. Um, I think the whole idea of your decision making um, is something that has really interested people through the questions that are coming through. Um, and um, it's quite hard to necessarily find a way that I can articulate three of these questions together. Um, but I uh, I think people are really asking, kind of, give us a step by step about how you go from A to B, which is obviously almost impossible to articulate. But I wondered if um, there's a, a description of your process being quite meditative, um, and that the, the, the kind of learning process from one project, kind of, that there be a seamlessness that goes through from one project to another. Um, and I wonder if that is something that you have identified that there is a kind of element that runs through that you're aware of that in your in your in your development well, of, of if architects. I can, if I can turn you around like this um and you can see a window there and on that window what you would see if you were able to see is a lot of paper <laughs> and um we favor this um this translucent paper this, this actually, this paper, um, schizom paper, you can, you can trace over it, you can scrunch it up, it's very satisfying. Yeah, I mean, this just, here's another one. You know, we just, we just have a lot of this paper. We tear it up and draw on it and draw over it, pass it back and forth, trace over each other's drawings. But when you say meditative, there is a lot of head down, drawing over drawing over drawing. And um, I don't know, we wouldn't be able to work without that. So. Yeah. But I think there's a, there's a pro, we, we use the term immersion. I think when we start any project, we, we really like to immerse ourselves in all aspects of it. So we're obviously really interested in context and place. So we like to find out as much as we can. Is it the place, the history of the place? But we're also really interested in the brief and the use and ethos so we try to understand the organization or institution we you know from pedantic things like drawing out the spaces in the brief to scale to get a sense of the relative size of things to a more philosophical understanding of what the intention for the use of the building is uh, so i think we do and i suppose things like what i call the pedantic drawing out of the brief so there are some kind of places that actually it's like, well, when I was teaching a lot, I used to say, sometimes you just need to do work to start work. So sometimes the work might be making a really nice drawing or model of the site and a drawing of the brief and things that you know in order to have known things that then work, that you can kind of work in your mind to, to, to dream up the concept from. Well, what happens then is you have that thing fixed in your head, you know, as a problem to be solved or something. And then you go out for a cycle, yeah. you know, or you, or you run for a bus or you go for a walk or something and something happens, like you just, something happens. And you, you come home and you think, I, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it, you know? And, and then you try and note it down really quick. So out of that attention to the discipline of the work itself, it seems to open up a possibility for the imagination to Pop up with, <laughs> pop up with something out of that, and there's a there is a magic. You know, there's a moment when you make a jump, and I mean, we are spatial. We're, we're spatial. Let's say, 
uh, you know, let's say it's space volume structure, you know, let's say that's what architecture is when it comes down to the actual practice, you know, space volume structure. But, mm. And but but you've got to find a way of anchoring your thought to a spatial volume structure concept. And sometimes that happens, you know, when you're not looking. But I think that has changed over time. And I think actually, this is maybe not useful, but I do think experience is part of the process of design. And I would say that our work has changed over the 30 something years of our practice, because the more you are in the world, in buildings and in spaces and in cities, the more the experience, spatial, the experiential thing of just being in a room or in a street or in a space, those things build up a kind mm. of, uh, you have a kind of internal yeah. catalog in your mind of different yeah. kinds of spaces. Because yeah. I know that when we were preparing a lecture that was a kind of overview of our practice, I don't know, a few years ago, looking back, I mean, our earlier work was much more orthogonal, much more kind of rational, you might say. And then it gradually, and actually, you know, it started through then maybe working with existing buildings, which have idiosyncratic aspects to them, which you didn't put there. And then you realize you really enjoy them and they really help. So working with existing buildings has been a huge help because you begin to realize that things don't have to have an absolutely uh, rational order to them, that they have to have an order, but the order might also be about experience and about light and shape and space. And I think that maybe is something that we learn over time through making, you know, through the number of things you've made, your way of making the next thing is the accumulation somehow. We're, you know, we're, we're saying this because we're getting old. We're old. And, I mean, we do have we have this funny conversation we've had it with so many people. We're you know we're friends with the Patkas who are people like us in Canada. I remember John Patkas saying to me, "Just name me an architect who didn't get worse the older he got." And then you find yourself trying to find architects who got better the older they got. And then you know. Then there's this terrible idea that mathematicians only last for three years or something, and poets burn out by the time they're 30. And but I, I think we both have this idea that we're we're just about beginning to get a handle on some on something. You know, we're just getting going in a way, um, because the, the world seems to be opening up. Um, what Sheila's calling experience has been an, an emollient or a a lubricant, you know, that we were, were more fluent. Um, but it gives you a, you know, that gives you a certain confidence that you've experienced something. But maybe all old times. people say that. I don't know. <laughs> um, I think we've got time for one more question, and it's that idea of, um, you know, you, you talked a lot about the the fact that in your um, process you you kind of have um, a lot of decisions that you're you're discussing and thinking about and. What is that thought process? You know, do you do you know where you're going um, when you start off? Um, mm -hmm. And you know, what are those sort of conflicting thoughts behind the projects, and how how do you navigate those um, uh, as you as you move through your process? I would say you probably don't know where you're going, and that's one of the interesting things. Well, you know, for example, we didn't know when we started working on the DNA that we'd end up thinking about the Vermeer sleeve, no. or and then going back to the thoughts that. John had written about that we both really enjoyed in the Yogi Yamamoto um, interview with Pim Vendors, which you know, something sticks in your mind. Like we found ourselves over the year often saying, you know, reminding ourselves of the statement that Vendors made. I'm wearing, I was wearing the shirt itself and the jacket itself. And in those, I felt like myself. And in a way, we felt that was a really interesting definition of what you're trying to do with your architecture. You want it to feel like itself, that the, that the, that the, not that it feels like ourself as the architect, but it feels like itself as the, the building, the use that it houses it should somehow be uh, resonant within the building. So I suppose you're trying to find a match between form and place and space and time, and then the particularities of the client and what the client's um, activities are and what they want the building to do. And yet you want to surprise them as well. You know, you want to do what I, they I want to do. I think we both do. share, I mean, what, you know, Sheila, I just remembering Sheila and I met, when we met as students, what, what we talked about, what we met was poetry and cinema. That's, that's how we got together. But both of us knew poems we learned in school and we could recite them to each other. And we went to the cinema together a lot. And I, I think we both probably think that there is a, purpose, a poetical purpose 
for architecture. You know, at a funeral, people don't only talk about what the person did, but somebody reads a poem, you know, and it, and it communicates. And I think there's a, similarly, architecture has a, so to speak, sacred purpose, which is a poetical purpose to embody thought and carry thought across generations, across eons. And we're just water carriers, you know, in that culture. Um, somebody has to do it. Um, we all do it. And it needs us to do it. Um, that's probably what, and we start again every day. But we start again every day on the basis that we don't think about anything else anyway. So it's not as if we're starting afresh every day, but we are starting again every day. So I suppose, we, I think we don't think that the work we're doing has a style or should have a style yeah. because we yeah. might, for example, use very different materials in different contexts because we're really interested in the idea of responding to the context. But yet there is there is a kind of ongoing conversation between the work that we've done, but that doesn't mean that they might look the same, but they particularly, I think, in the attitude to space and movement and in between, I think the subject of that kind of in-between space, the relationship between the, the program spaces, which have um, a kind of given necessity in terms of dimension and form, and then the spaces to connect them and move between them. I think that that's something that I would say runs through particularly a lot of the recent work we've done. But on the other hand, we're doing just starting on a lot of social housing at the moment. And in a way, it just in one way you might say it doesn't have those kind of spaces, but then again, it does. Mm -hmm. You're thinking about the circulation and is it a deck and is the deck a place and how does it work and where's the stairs and how does it. So I think that sense of the bits the bits that are actually not the, the main, you know, if you made that diagram of the brief, it's the other bit that's just called circulation is probably sometimes what holds the whole thing together. And that's what we're, and it's just interesting what just happened to have within this three, three projects in downtown Dublin for three different social housing projects and just trying to think about such an interesting subject because it's the world really, housing. Also, it's a huge social issue. In that's Ireland. what we've been doing today. We've been working on, on them today. So we're here in the west of Ireland designing social housing in the city of Dublin. But there's a nice quote from T.S. Eliot just come up on the screen. That's very nice. Unreal city under a brown fog of silver dawn, a crowd flowed over London Bridge. There you go. That's yeah. it. That's it. The one that's about it. the T.S. Eliot about the yellow fog, well, that's also really well, interesting, which is, the window pane. which is a bit like yeah. the space in between where you talk about the fog moving between things. In the but, you know, I mean, you go in the door of a building, you cross a threshold, you come into the hall, you go down the passage, you find the stair, you arrive in the room. That's it, you know, that is it. Thank you so much, John and Sheila. Thank you for your time and uh, for all that you have said. Thank you yeah, and thank shared you. with us today. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. We look forward you, to um, being in the school, uh, hopefully physically next year. Yes, we Thank do too. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, good luck with the football. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. And thanks, uh, John and Sheila. I'm sure that we will be seeing you very, very soon over here, as you say. And, uh, you know, thank you all for attending this uh, in such large numbers, because it's been a really uh, very important uh, uh, aspect of our end of year show events. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, good luck in all your thank careers. You. In thank, you. Yes. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Sheila. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.